there's not enough time to actually look at the mushrooms. Uh, so uh, Martin's got a um, nicer schedule with this weekend. And it's an extra day. So you have more time. So um, it's fun to be here. I was in uh, Canada, no, 1994 was the last time. Um, the now, one more thing about now, I think the next time before I next year is going to be, I don't remember if it's Oregon. Seattle. Seattle? Seattle yeah. area. Yeah. Um, so that's not too far away. Yeah. Um, and the year after that, there's a chance it's in um, Wisconsin, Michigan, somewhere over there. Excellent. So all the morning in the woods. Yeah, so. They, <laughs> well, I mean, if you're going to come drive to Fort McMurray to, to, to Pinch and Creek, you can certainly drive to, to Seattle. <laughs> we'll be for your gas. We'll be for your gas. So, yeah, so. It's a beautiful drive. You guys probably have a trustee, right? Do you have a regional trust? Are you the regional trustee too? You're wearing several hats. Um, anyway, that's a point for now. Um, yeah, we have a bus. You can organize and get down there. Uh, this was, um, I'm on Facebook for better or worse, and this was something that my uh, Noah Siegel posted a couple days ago about uh, these orange milk mushrooms. So we, we've got a bunch over there, and they're probably not going to get a name. Like, I'm not going to get a real name because they probably don't have a real name at this point. But we've been calling them all Lactarius deliciosus. And he, here's a, a chart of six different orange latex mushrooms in that group, whether they're all suffered or not. But he gave them different common names. <laughs> there. The one on the top left is the one, the true Lactarius deliciosus, which is in Europe. And nobody's proved that we have that species in the US. We have all these other lookalikes. Some of them have a lot of green seed. Some of them, and none of them are as nice edibles as deliciosis. So we have something called determinus, which refers to being bad. Uh, but anyway, um, if you collect and describe and get DNA from these things, you can start to sort out what actually we have, and which ones grow with spruce, which ones grow with pine, which ones grow with fir. So it's um, specimens and descriptions and photos of DNA help you tell, you tell you what how many different species you might have. And that's, um, several people have been working on that, um, but we don't have a final story. Um, but anyway, so that's a reason to collect and document the fungi. Um, specimens. There's, um, Steps in this process. Um, this is the part we do before you, like, um, out in the field or before you have to go out in the field. You want to have an idea of where you want to go and collect. Unless you're like walking down Michigan Avenue and there's a, some, you know, snake horns under the elm trees, um, you can do opportunists to collecting like that in your neighborhood or area. Otherwise, you can find, figure out where the best area might be, or if you're um, doing surveys at a particular site for part of a program or study, um, figure out where you want to go, um, and then figure out when you want to go because rainfall is important for mushroom production. Um, it's been a bit dry here, but we still have a lot of stuff. We probably have more stuff if, if it was wetter, but um, that's the thing we have a problem with in the Chicago area is we have to keep track of rainfall because the last month um, we've had very little, so there isn't very much out in the woods. Um, and then know whether you need a permit, because in the, in the Chicago area we need a permit for the county parks. Um, up here, I don't know if you need permits for your reserves and areas. We need permits for, we need permits for provincial parks, <coughs> provincial, officially provincial recreation areas, and for sure ecological um, reserves, and um, yeah. And, so you have and, to and, in the, and then we've got national parks where you need more than just you need you need permits and you need permits and, and a lot of encouragement I guess from them and even let you in. Right. So I mean, last year we did last year we, we did Elk Island National Park, the first ever fungal biodiversity survey of Elk Island, and they invited us and gave us permits and, and 
first time they actually allowed that. Yeah, so you figure out who who is uh, kind of both the what's the jurisdiction who's in charge of that property and what their uh, permit policy is. Um, main quality collection, that's something Mark mentioned yesterday. Um, collecting old rotted mushrooms, even though it looks might look cool, might not make the best specimen down the line. Um, collect things where you have several food bodies of different ages um, that show the different features as the mushroom expands and grows up. Um, and um, get those on the dryer fairly soon um, so they don't start to rot overnight or something if they're working on it. Um, fill out field labels like Mark said. Um, you can take, there's two ways to take photos or both. You can take photos when you're out in the woods and or take photos like they're doing over there on a gray card, um, some kind of studio shot and, um, with a more controlled setting. Um, when you collect things for um, documentation, you want to keep them separate. So you don't want to get your mushrooms banged around and mixed up together and you get spores from this mushroom over on the cap of this other mushroom. Um, that's not good. You want to keep each collection discrete, like put the three fruit bodies from this thing in that one bag and put stuff in another bag. Um, the little things, smaller things can go in any kind of um, smaller containers you have, if it's a taco box or various sizes. Um, small things are okay in here, um, but moisture will build up in here, so you want to uh, make sure they don't get too wet. You don't want to put mushrooms in plastic because the moisture gets trapped and the mushroom starts to rot faster. You want them to be able to breathe like a vegetable. And sometimes I start a spore print in the field. Um, so you can take, cut the cap off, put it on a piece of white paper, put it in your box or in your bag, and lay it in the bottom of your um, basket or whatever so that the gills are facing down onto the paper and then the spores can start to drop um, on your way home. Um, the other thing, you can sometimes find spore prints on top of caps that are above other caps. And then know where you are um, so you can document the location and if you have a, a um, GPS device to get the bottom of the bunch, that's, that's also good. Um, so here's the, the second part is what they're doing here um, and uh, what we did some in the workshop is to um, describe the specimens. Um, so you fill, finish filling out your field label, um, assign a collection number. For this foray, unless you're making your own collections, they're doing a, a foray number um, over there. And um, they're doing photos and then Tom's going to talk about how to do the DNA. Um, and then there's dryers on the back wall, which are basically food dehydrators. Um, and you might dry those overnight. And then you put them in a resealable bag so that they don't, the moisture doesn't um, get back into the mushroom very fast. And then you need to keep those dry. If you store mushrooms in bags in your house that's humid, the moisture is eventually going to get into the bag and start molding the mushroom. And then if you're transporting specimens, you might want to freeze them for a week. So when specimens go come into or go out of a herbarium, we freeze them for a week to make sure there's no uh, black flux so it kills anything that might be uh, before we uh, uh, bring those in. Yeah. How do you take the tissue sample from the DNA? Yeah, That's what Tom's going to talk about. Okay. So um, No, they always stay, any documentation you do on a mushroom stays with the mushroom or in a database. Or um, in the old days, if you had these big black and white prints, they go in a file cabinet with the collection number indexed with the specimen. So everything's associated with specimen. Um, what I've been doing and what they're doing here is they have um, collection numbers pre-printed for the foray and the year and a number with a 
one centimeter scale bar, and they cut these up. Um, they also have another set that are um, um, sticky paper to put on the DNA cards. Um, I do this with my own collection numbers um, because if I don't, it's easy for me to duplicate numbers. So I cut these, I print these out. When I need more numbers, I cut them up, I put them in this little box, and I use them one at a time. That way I don't get any duplicate numbers. And this, this number, like you might have seen in some other pictures, this slip goes in the photo. So you don't have to write down, like in the old days, you know, photo three was this and photo four was that. You have the collection number in the photo. Um, there's a really big book that was produced on methods for doing uh, mycological science and mostly on um, doing the collecting or uh, field studies. And there's a couple of good chapters on here if you want to really get into documenting or what's, what some of the details are. There's um, a couple chapters. Chapter two is on um, preserving specimens for herbaria. So some of that applies. Chapter eight is the one you probably want to read in um, collecting methods and it includes um, describing. And actually there's a PDF so if you search on collecting and describing macrofungi, um, um, you can find this PDF online. There's a couple other chapters from that book that are have PDFs online. Or you can um, or you can email me for a, a link to that. Okay. This is from that book. Um, pointing out the um, importance of collections. So basically Specimens um, document any surveys you're doing, like for Alberta or other areas. Um, the, the field notes and material with that documents the information with that specimen, so you can actually work, do work with it to figure out what it is later. And then um, years and years later, which in my case, 100 years later, you can go and look at old preparing stuff and figure out whether the identification was correct or not. And if you don't have a specimen, you obviously can't do that. But specimens open up other, lots of other studies um, that can be done with that specimen, not just the DNA work. So you guys write everything in pen? Um, I don't. I don't tend to use pencil. I use just a ballpoint pen. Yeah, because like I've done surveying, and it's just everything in the book is written in pencil. Pencil that doesn't break down over time, but the ink does. Yeah. So like after you've had your collection card with your mushroom for five years, the ink may be gone. Depending on the type of ink. So it's always been insisted we do survey. Yeah. So that's the, that's the very best practice. Yeah. Do you, do you do the yeah. one thing you don't want to use is like a felt tip pen or any kind of water pen pen because those leach through the paper or run or whatever. So that's the worst thing to do. Um, when, we're, when we're doing stuff in the herbarium, like making annotations on little slips of name changes, we'll use an archival. It's basically like a Sharpie, but it's an archival type fine point Sharpie to wear um, permanent labels. So most of our stuff, just for your interest, is we, we move it electronically, okay. and all the little cards and everything, they just go away. That's what I was wondering. Yeah, because we just don't have the Space, place to keep stuff like that. You have space on the internet, but you don't have space in the real world. Um, this was from the book on um, some of the criteria for putting a specimen in a barrier. And the first two would apply to us. So, does the specimen adequately document? Basically, is it a good specimen of that representing that species? It's not. You know, it's not old, it's not too buggy, it's, the whole thing is there, it's not just the cap with the, half the stem missing. Um, and then is there nice documentation with location and date, and habitat, and all that stuff, um, specimen, that all helps with the value. Um, you probably know a lot about collecting equipment already, field bed labels, something to put the mushrooms in, something to collect the mushroom with, um, Whatever size knife you're comfortable with, um, I use like a paring knife. 
But if you're bucking things on wood, you might need a bigger knife to, to cut it off the wood. Yeah, um, actually, Jim Gans off the sea, he does an interesting thing. He carries, he's got one of those, you know, for moose butchering things. So what you do is you got a, you actually have a little saw and a knife. And actually, he literally cuts the piece of wood and then takes his knife and just uses a little piece of wood to, to as a chisel to, to, to flip the piece off. And then you actually, Get uh, get the piece of wood with the uh, with the funge. Yeah, the, some of our stuff we're going to get because nice like pieces of wood that were sawn. Yeah, you know, on all four sides. Yeah, that beautiful specimen. Of wood. Yeah, and that's perfect for polypores. Yeah. So if anybody really likes polypores, you get your saws out. Yeah. So now we're that's like a, a hatchet and a saw and a big knife. You know, all the logs that we're looking for sculpture wood. Chainsaw. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you put on the field label in your notes? So actually this shouldn't be at the top. That's the most optional thing, um, but it's usually on the top of the label. Um, what, what you or the mycologist thinks this, the mushroom is. Um, your name and your number, or the 4A collection number, or whatever system you're using, the collection date. So here it's not as critical because 4A4 was today. So the people entering over there know that 4A4 was today. Um, but if you're collecting on your own, you do want the collection date. That's Patrick, when you pull it out of the ground. Yeah. It still is helpful because you might go to the 4A4 site on a different day as well. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, just put number 31 if it's today, put one if it's tomorrow. You don't have to put August 2013, I suppose. Just helps a little bit to have some kind of a date on it. Right. It would be great. Thanks. And then also the collection date, you want to put the four digit year. The year has four digits, not two. A hundred years ago, a hundred years from now, or actually a hundred years ago, if you just put 95, and that's 1895, and it's put in a database online in Michael Portal, and you're looking, and Harper has this collection of Michael Portal, and it says 1995, and you know, well, you know, that's 1895. It's just that the, the database made it, assumed it was 1995. So you want to put the four-digit year in, um, in anything, any documentation. Um, and then as much information you can about the location, the more the better. Um, um, in the U.S., we have states and counties. I don't know if you have. Do you have any provinces? Do have, <laughs> provinces, counties. Do you have counties? So we have county counties and municipal districts. Municipal districts. We have. You have. What's the district word? Hmm? It's synonymous. Counties. Yeah. County district. And I mean, what's the name of what we're in? And the Apache Creek. Okay. So you want to put that like database and they want to eventually put that in there. During the foray, everybody knows where you are, but when you want a documentation, document it into the database, or if you're doing stuff on your own, you want to have those different levels of breakdown so that somebody like me who doesn't know Canada and goes to Google and Google's West Castle and Google doesn't know where West Castle is, and you find a weather station website and it says West Castle population zero. And you wonder if it's West Castle a town or is it a river or you know what is it? And then you see it spelled two words or one word. It's like, you know, you want to figure that out. So anyway. And then uh, latitude and longitude you can get off of a map or from a GPS unit. And then describe the habitat, what kind of trees are there, what the mushroom is growing on. If it's on wood you want to know. At least if it's hardwood or conifer, if you can tell. If you don't know what kind of wood is, take some of the wood, or usually always take some of the wood, and then years later, somebody absolutely needs to know, they can probably figure out what kind of wood it is based on microscopy of the wood. And the host is, um, host is what tree or what it's associated with. Uh, a couple of miscellaneous things. So we mentioned these labels. So 
what, whatever collection numbering system you want, if you have this little label, this is a stage with the specimen, it goes on the dryer with the specimen, it goes in the bag with the specimen. This is the huh? It goes in the photo of the specimen. So this this is like the companion of your dried mushroom. It's always going to be part of it. Um, it stays with it. And then um, um, Barbara mentioned using a pencil. The other thing is the paper you use, you can use um, um, archival quality paper, which is basically cotton without any acids or um, glue or whatever in it. Not lasts longer. Um, laser printers are fine. Dot matrix printers are probably not. Um, it's a different kind of ink process. Um, this is from the book. It's, this is like detail. But basically, you dry the collections. You want to dry the collections and not cook the specimens. Things like ammonitis and a few other things like lower temperatures because they have softer tissues and they collapse um, too fast if it's hotter. Um, you want to make sure they're completely dry before you put it in that Ziploc bag. The problem with the Namacore is Sunday morning, everybody's in a hurry and they throw everything in the bags. And they ship them to the field museum and there's like 10 of them, five or 10 that are old because they weren't completely dry um, when there's a bag. So you want to make sure they're dry. So the way to do that is they're definitely crisp, crispy like fresh potato chips and not like wilted potato chips. <laughs> so you have to like carefully see if they're like um, crunchy without breaking them. It takes a little practice. Um, and then lichens are, um, they're not, lichens are not put in a dryer typically because they need to do chemistry later on and the heat affects the chemistry. And slime molds are small enough they can be very dry. But they're not fungi anyway. But, um, if you like taking pictures, you can put your photos on Mushroom Observer and have other people around the country um, give their opinions and vote on what they think their mushroom is. <coughs> The better the picture, the more votes or more comments you might get. A um, couple words on latitude, longitude. Um, this part of the world, we have a um, positive latitude degrees because we're north of the equator, and we have a negative longitude because we're west of England, basically where the meridian is that goes around this one. So this is what our latitude and longitude numbers might look like. Um, the current trend is just do um, degrees with the decimal point and not do degrees, minutes, seconds, because that's just really more work to do in a database. You just, and and um, GPS things now just give you this. Um, I did this at the museum um, and also using the website, trying to figure out how much do these dis different decimal points relate to out like in the woods? So this two, if you add, if you make this three three instead of three two, that's a distance about one kilometer for that um, difference between 30, 49, 32 and 49, 33. It's, it depends if it's latitude or longitude, it's about eight to 11. Um, third digits, 10th bad, fourth digits, 10 meters. So most of my stuff, I just do the four digits. I don't. Um, you can you can um, write the other digits out, but um, they tend to not mean anything after a while. So when I looked up West Castle Wetlands Ecological Reserve, they gave this. But you'll see this a lot for mapping systems because they they'll take the reserve and they figure out the center of the reserve, and then that's the center of the reserve. But if you figure out what these all these decimals mean, you go out here, the tenth digit is that much of a kilometer. It's that much of a meter. It's 0 0.01 <laughs> millimeter, which is equal to 11 micrometers. And if you do any microscopy, you know 11 micrometers is a, how big mushroom spores are. So, this, you don't need all those numbers. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> if you're working with bacteria, maybe. You know, but if your if your collecting area is the size of this room, that's you know, you know. Plus, it depends on how accurate your GPS is too. Also, if you if you have your GPS and you're getting a reading, you can see that last decimal point, you know, going three, four, nine, six, five. You know, it's fluctuating. So you might want to ignore that fluctuating decimal point. Use whatever. But I, there was a, last year there was a workshop on GPS stuff, and they were, um, the woman was, um, she was a, a digital mapping specialist. She was saying how, telling you how you figure out what the center point of this an area, and then you say how much error, error there is. So if the, if your site is like two kilometers, like I use, but if your site's like two kilometers wide and you just give the center point, then you can say your error or wherever you're in that area is like one kilometer. Um, but she was still using all these, <coughs> all this. And I said, I said those, I was like, she wasn't using 10 digits, but like six or eight. And I said, well, there's, you know, that six decimal points, they don't mean anything. And she didn't get it, she didn't understand that. It was just, that's the way they do it. So. Yeah, um, but personally, I I don't know. Um, anyway, well, why is the location so important to the enamel? Well, it's, it's, exactly it's not. It's important for the collection of the herbarium because then, if it has latitude longitude, you can map yes. the specimens. So if you go to microportal.org, the specimens that have latitude longitude will show up on a map. So we'll have a map of North America and you can see where it's been collected. If the specimen doesn't have latitude too much, they don't put it on a map until somebody does the you know conversion, figuring out this county or this city or whatever and figuring out the best coordinate for that description of the location and then they can go on a map. That's a tedious process. So if you can get the correct GPS right off the bat, even somewhat roughly, that helps in the long term figure out, you know, does this, you know, mushroom grow like like Martin said, not you know, or recently nobody knew any fungi that grew in Alberta because nobody was documenting them. But now that you are, you can figure out you can add to distributions. And Paul was saying we're on the east side of the mountain range, so we probably have stuff here that's not on the, the west side. We have stuff here that's not over like um, Minnesota what, what is microportal.org? That's, um, so microportal.org is a website that's pulling herbarium data from the major collections of mushrooms in the country. I think that includes Canada. Patrick, I'm also interested actually with what you were saying about and what Chip was asking about. So why a lot of this stuff is really important? I mean, this is important for, in general, for us today. You know, we've gone to some sites and we've gathered up some mushrooms. What we want to do is we want to be able to let all our members across Alberta, when they find something really interesting, like every once in a while you stumble across something that's really cool, that should be preserved and whatnot, we want you to be able to to gather, the, to take the specimen and make the specimen, describe it, use the location, and actually dry it, like Patrick was uh, explaining, and actually send it in, and, and, and hopefully send it in with a piece of DNA that's attached. And we're kind of, this is a concept that, I, that we're working on, so that whether you are, you know, camping up in Rock Lake in, in, in North Kenton or, or out here in Cypress Hills, if all of a sudden you stumble across something that's really, really cool that you think needs to, needs to be documented, then it's a way of, of sending it to us and we've got a way of handling it with that has reliable data. And so so I mean right now the only thing that kind of hits our database is stuff that um, is stuff that we're verifying here with mycologists because the other stuff that a lot of times on, on regular forays we just put names on stuff like that. We don't have specimens that go with it. And it might be this, and it's our best guess, and you know, and it's, you know, it, it, 
it's not really valuable information. So what we want to do is kind of kick everything we up, we do up a notch to be able to look at details and have you guys submit something. You know, when you're out, when you're out at uh, at Grand River Falls, and you find something cool, and you say, "Oh, this is really neat. This is the first time I've seen something like that." And then you can actually collect it and kind of go through a bit of this process. And we're going to develop this process and document it a little bit better so that people can actually do this. Or you got something growing in your backyard that's bizarre and you can't find in any book and you think you got something neat, collect it and send it in. So basically, so that's why this is really yeah, important. This is, but this is like best case scenario. This is what's desired. You know, most documentation you can get in various formats, photo, description, Thank you. 